Welcome to Popcast Deluxe. You are had to make another show. I'm getting claustrophobic of weekly cultural review. I'm John Caramonica, a critic at the New York Times. I'm Joe Coscarelli, a reporter at the New York Times. Before we get into the big conversation this week, uh, there's a subscribe button. I think there's even a QR code. Sure. Like, why not? Like, I mean, I haven't quite figured out how you can like be looking at it on your phone, but also scanning it with your phone. Mm. But if you're looking it's at it on a screen experience, it is a two screen experience. Um, you know, if you're like following up from the Mr. Beast video on your home TV and then you can go to the deluxe anyway, like, and subscribe, uh, youtube.com slash podcast. Bing, bing. Joe, what makes a great album? Great. I have some thoughts on that this week. Okay. Um, I also have some thoughts on what other people think makes a great album great. Right. They are not the same as what I think. I want to talk about that in regards to two albums. So obviously, here we are uh, in the in the light, the bold light of Cowboy Carter, act the two. second act of the Beyonce trilogy that came out on Friday. Uh also, genre, genre sad, sad boy. boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We will be going very deep it, <laughs> on the trip you read, Machine Gun Kelly collab as, album. as a literal total sidebar, you saw the whole thing on Twitter with, <laughs> with the, the producer, producer. But then it was like maybe fake. Yeah. I don't know. You saw the fake, like the press yes. release or like yeah. the, the TikTok Good with the lips. all around. Really, really solid. If that was a marketing strategy... Like genuinely really good. Beautiful. Like like actually like get that person a raise. Yep. If you are that person, yep. send us an email. Yep. Podcast. And if it was stuff. just marketing for the producer themselves. Also like, great. Great. Yeah. Also great. Every part of it. Great. Yep. Um, we're not going to be talking tragically about genre sad boy today, but maybe <laughs> maybe in another time. Uh, so we're talking about Cow- Cowboy Carter. Um, I also want to talk about the future and Metro Boomin album, We Don't Trust You. Um, okay. These are two albums where there is the quality of the music and then there is the discourse about the music. Oh, yeah. And obviously, we live in a an era of extremely robust meta-narratives about culture. If you're lucky, especially. Yes. I mean, that is the goal, in a sense, is yeah. to have as robust a meta-narrative as possible on top of the music. I think something that we've talked about a lot and I think which comes up a lot in how criticism has evolved is often people mistake the volume, intensity, and depth of meta narrative for the quality of the product itself, of yes. the music itself. And I think we both have strong feelings about that. And so for both of these albums, obviously I want to talk about music, but I also want to talk about how people talk about these records. Um, I mean, in in a sense, I want to fall victim to the same thing that these folks are falling victim to. Sure, but but meta meta, we're gonna we're gonna pull back one more layer. That is correct. Yeah. Um. So let's start with Beyonce. What should we play? Let's play the electric sitar on American Requiem, the first track. Sure. And then let's talk about whether the double I for Act Two and all the song titles. Is just an I or it means two? Because it's both and it's, it's both. confusing. It's both. Uh, do you feel me? A lot happening on this. Is John album. Batiste rocking the sitar? I'm gonna have to assume yes. You think he? You think his hands are on the whatever that whatever that instrument is? I want to yeah. see what like right. sounds great. But is it an actual or right. is it a digital? Is it like Andre 3000 with the electronic, the electric wind instrument, the Yui e- Yui? I'm gonna go ahead Yui? and say it is real because I thought, and we'll get oh, to see, this. See, I thought the opposite. No, we'll okay. get to this. But in the press release, yeah. For Cowboy Carter, which is the er text of this, the this is the most Beyonce has spoken about her music in, in like years, five years. Yeah, in the the giant press release that came with this album, uh, and she says specifically that this album is a reaction to AI, 
and that she wanted to return to real instruments because of the rise of artificial intelligence. Yes. So I'm going to go ahead and say... It's a real instrument. It's a real instrument. And I'm going to go ahead and say that real instruments include digital instruments. <laughs> Respectfully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, this is... Man, where do we start with this record? Um, Cowboy Carter was advertised as a country record or indicated. Advertised maybe too strong a word. Sure was nodded to that it was a country record. Uh, and I wrote this piece last week about how that's a bit of a red herring and it kind of doesn't matter. And also when people hear country, they think mainstream, they're thinking Luke Combs and Morgan Wallen, they're thinking mainstream Nashville. And it turned out that from a discursive approach, that was actually quite a smart strategy to roll out this album yeah. to say it's country, which immediately puts it in a lineage of black participants in a genre that has historically excluded them. Uh, it automatically sets up a political valence for the album uh, and a, a kind of cultural power of Beyonce is coming to reclaim black narratives in country music. And also an antagonist, like the whole thing with the radio station, not wanting to play the singles, which were the mo which are really the most country songs on the album in a yes. lot of ways. 16 and Carriages and also just told them. All red herrings, like all fake. Imagine being the person who emailed the random country station in Oklahoma. Sure. Or, and just be like, why are you not? Like, yeah. And literally that poor guy just being like, I didn't know there was a beyond. I'm sorry. We're an independent station. Like, please, <laughs> please don't yell at me. This is like, the most emails I've ever yeah, gotten in my life. Yeah. Like, just <laughs> save that energy for iHeart. Save it for the elections. You know? Like, right. Um, but then she comes out and says, it's not a country album. It's a Beyonce album. Which is true. That was like the second shoe. It is true. It's true. And then she's like, ha ha, gotcha. This album is about genre sad boy genre <laughs> just genre. Genre. <laughs> it was about machine gun kelly um although it sort of is about machine gun kelly we're gonna get to the post malone part <laughs> oh my gosh so it, it's about genre it's okay so having listened to this album a few times now i was really trying to think hard about why an artist of beyonce stature is making an album that sounds like this and the thing that it sounds and this like, and this and this yes and and, that. and what it reminds me is obviously like are there country or roots music referent points and antecedents like absolutely but especially once you get into like the midpoint towards like the three like from like the thirty percent mark to like the eighty percent really mark, long album incredibly long what it reminded me of is actually. 1970s singer songwriter like folk or roots adjacent music it's auteur it's like folk auteur music mm -hmm. it's not a country record mm -hmm. it's a folk auteur record it's and roots it's about roots ambient it's for about all, all genre yeah. um and and obviously these songs are are rendered with like some modern twists some songs more than others um it's also a bit of a chaotic record. It yeah. does not land on a style, like uh, on a firm style. Like if you look at Renaissance, I know like I like Renaissance a little bit more than you, but the one thing that I think you can say about Renaissance is it's fundamentally devoted to a style. Though it, it also leans spans a lot of versions, sub -versions of, that of that style, yeah. but it does tell one bigger umbrella story yes. about black dance music. Yes. This album does not do that. And it's interesting because I think I think it feels like it's doing that with all the little interludes, the Willie Nelson, the Dolly Parton, uh, the Linda Martell. Like, I think it feels like it's trying to stitch together a narrative with loud parts that are um, screen grabbable. But I don't actually think as an album that it's telling that story front to back. I think if I had to guess... A lot of these songs, you know, we've talked about this previously. Beyonce doesn't work on a song for 20 minutes and put it out. Some stuff's been sitting around. Some stuff's recent. Some stuff's been sitting around and then changed more recently. I think there are a number of songs that fit into the kind of like singer, songwriter, whatever, big R umbrella, which, of course, singer, songwriter music classically is like one person yep. making one set of lyrics. Which is interesting and in, and, in the Beyonce and, universe. And in the Beyonce universe, that's not what this is. Like, it's funny. Do you see the tweet that like one of the interesting kind of like 
head fakes about how Beyonce makes music is there are so many component parts yeah. that you're sort of uh, obliged to think of her as, as an, an auteur. auteur. Yeah, I think yes. this was Louis from Pop Yeah, I think it's Louis. Yes. Yeah, shout out to Louis. Um, which I think is fundamentally correct. And I think, you know, Beyonce is like the, the lead orchestrator of all these ideas is what we've been seeing and hearing from her for the last, certainly the last like Since five years, six years. I'd say a decade. Yeah, Since that's probably right. Yeah, that's that's probably right. And so also in the piece that I wrote, there is this I, I mentioned this and there is this transition for Beyonce. And I think it's roughly around the same time. Hit maker to conversation starter. Sure. Now, if you are making an album with the express goal of starting conversations. Then this is the best album ever. I have seen that take. <laughs> if that's your goal, have, I'm saying if that is the goal. I have seen that I have seen that opinion expressed for that reason right. on the internet. There's the most footnotes, reference points, yes, uh, allusions, samples, collaborators. Yeah. Can, can I just read something? Uh, I mean, it's from the Wikipedia page, but it's just it's an easy credits thing. Is it from the impact section? It's not from the impact <laughs> You saw that there was an impact section immediately, and the first line was, this album has had impact. I did <laughs> like, not know. That's, but that's like a good, that's a good summary that's of where good, you're going with this conversation, yes. which is like, if this album exists to have impact, it, it immediately has It's self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> yes. um, so samples and interpolations. You have Blackbird by the Beatles. You have a Sun House record, Chuck Berry. You have uh, Linda Martell. You have Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Nicks. You have Lee Hazelwood, Nancy Sinatra. You've got the Beach Boys. Uh, Underworld? Yeah. There's an Underworld sample. That probably should have been on the last record. But anyway, um, Patsy Klein. You know, sure. it's a and number on and of on things. And on. Yeah. Yes. And I think when I say screen grabbable, what I really mean is digestible in small parts. And I think what's happened and happens in this record and happens in a lot of records and also happens on some level with the future records we'll get to. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah, yeah, but it's true. But it's true. Um, We're going to talk about Rodney O. It's, yes, absolutely. Um, but people, especially I want to say younger listeners, say, oh, Beyonce covered the Beatles. That's inherently interesting. And then, and then you open the Wikipedia and you get the next slide. Yes. And so that's inherently interesting. And I also think one of the struggles, and look with these samples, for example, this is where I become an old person, right? Like I'm old enough to remember when the act of sampling was inherently radical, just very simply unlicensed sampling was inherently radical. I'm also old enough to remember when the deliberate deployment of an unexpected or perhaps counterintuitive sample felt raw and also embedded into a narrative. But that was 35 years ago. And this is a long time. And so I, for me, at least as a listener, sampling a well-known old record is not that exciting. Even if you're going to flip it in some way. Like doesn't you want, really you want to matter. Talk about Caribou doing Manny Fresh? <laughs> <laughs> This is a big co conversation I, piece yes, over um, the weekend. Um, that was, and also, um, or even a different kind of sample, like whatever Sexy Red is doing in her video, which is basically just like a, an era sample. Yeah, um, just putting Fabo in yeah, there. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Fabo, uh, we love you. Um, so, so to me, I think a lot of the conversation about this record gets lost, and I sometimes find this, like I did not review this record, Um but I find this a challenge sometimes when I'm reviewing an album like this, where I feel like I have to mention all the things. Every single Easter egg. Yes, because I know everybody on the internet will say, why didn't you mention this Easter egg? Wouldn't that change your whole approach? It's actually, no, it won't change my whole approach because as a critic, I try to take a slightly more holistic, distanced person. Uh, uh, it's not listen. all data points. Yeah, but I think because an album like this has so many data points. I mean, I uh, in an earlier episode, we talked about when you're rolling out, you have to have like a thousand touch points or a thousand, thousand points of light. Uh, you have to have a thousand touch points. This album is like, I got your thousand touch points. Yeah. And so people will be talking about those touch points and not really talking about do the songs work. Exactly. And I do think, you know, I had a little bit of this with Renaissance yeah. and I have it more here. Like Beyonce has really gone from 
under explaining, arguably, to over explaining. Yeah. And a lot of the references you're talking about are not even woven into the music, but they're in these interludes. You have the Willie Nelson, you have literally yes. a radio dial flipping through the history of genre. And literally like every like Americana artist who's ever done that is like, why doesn't anyone care when I do this? And then you have Linda Martell, a historical figure in her own right. I'm sure her Wikipedia got a mad hits yeah. over the weekend. Sure. Saying like, Genre is a tricky concept. You know, there's a lot of literal explaining in this. And then in the lyrics, so, you know, we started with American Requiem. That's the first line of the album. There's a lot of talking going yes. on. You know, the last part of that of, of that song where she explains, you know, uh, they said I was too country. Now yep. they say I'm not country enough. Mm -hmm. Again, that's the fundamental uh, tension in country music yeah, yeah. throughout its whole history country not country enough mm -hmm. we talked about it with jelly roll of we talked about it with every you know every country artist i highly recommend major labels a book about genre if you care about this <laughs> it sounds like beyonce might have dipped into this book mm -hmm. uh <laughs> over you think? over oh, i mean okay someone should buy it for her if she has it it's like it's it's very much about this project and what these barriers mean and don't mean and how people self-identify i also just want to add one additional tweak to the country um framing which is and I, in, in the piece that I wrote, and I think even in the piece that Cesario wrote about country radio, it's like we're thinking about country as a sound versus country as a business. And like, which are you doing? Sure. Which are you participating in? And like the contention being that country as a sound is where she's trying to live versus country as a business, which is fine. Uh, and I think probably the right approach. Um, but there's a third thing that I think probably should be uh, leaned in on, which is country as a mode of being. Mm. And I think when Beyonce is saying they said I was too country, I think what she's talking about is the 90s and being like a, an R&B singer Having with a southern clear accent. southern accent yeah. and, and in her phrasing, like much more influenced by what we would think of as southern soul than like, say, Motown or whatnot. Though so that's on this album too. Yes, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're living 20 years after that. But yeah. I think if you think of early reads on Beyonce solo and also Destiny's Child, that's, that's a third kind of country. And I feel like that's, I, I'm actually sort of intrigued. I wish I was hearing more about that and the lineage of music that she's making here connected to the late 90s and the 2000s. What's interesting to me, and you know, it's funny, Beyonce said that every song on this album is a reference to like a Western that they were playing yeah, on in, TV, you yes. know, and one of the ones she listed was Killers of the Flower Moon. Yes. And I feel like there's a very, the, my criticism of that movie of Martin Scorsese is like, he's like, all right, people haven't, haven't got the subtleties of my work. Like here, fine. These guys are bad. Yes. And it's, and Beyonce maybe is suffering from the same thing. You know, she talks about losing album of the year. We had the Jay-Z speech at the Grammys. Mm -hmm. I don't want to embarrass this young lady, but she has more Grammys than everyone and never won album of the year. So even by your own metrics, that doesn't work. Think about that. The most Grammys, never won album of the year. That doesn't work. She's like, all right, it was daddy lessons, too subtle. Coachella, where I'm gonna weave all this black music in, so artfully, mm -hmm. every not a wasted second. You know, I'm gonna mm -hmm. do this lineage through the black marching band tradition. Mm -hmm. Like that go over people's heads? I don't know. You know, so she's like, all right, fine. Like I'm really, really, really gonna spell it out for you guys. And that's how you end up with Blackbird, a Beatles cover, the second song on a Beyonce album featuring black country artists. Blackbird. for black female country artists um i will say you know I, I personally obviously was extremely excited to see tanner adele on the record this is someone who i think is really promising and does a lot of the work that i am i think if you had said to me six months ago like beyonce is going to make like a mainstream country record that's sort of what i think it would sound like sure. right um these singers to me feel underutilized on this and also why on this song and why not more space? And that's where we get back into like the footnoting. It's like, if you've seen Paul McCartney in the last two decades, he gives Paul McCartney, come on podcast. Deluxe. He gives the same canned speech every night before he sings Blackbird about how it's about the civil rights movement. And mm -hmm. it, you know, it was like subtle and it had to be subtle about it. And you know, it's, this is, 
this is known, you know, again, I'm sure it's on the Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. And that gesture is meaningful. And it's especially meaningful coming from Beyonce. Again, a lot of people probably learned that from a TikTok over mm -hmm. the weekend. Mm -hmm. Even if you if you haven't had the the pleasure or uh, of going to Old Cello, <laughs> uh, yes, whatever it was, and like <laughs> that's fine, which you did, which I did, yes. Uh, but do I want to hear a history lesson, or, or or just like a cover of Blackbird? Like it's straight up, especially on the as like right after Beyonce is exploding this idea of genre. Mm -hmm. It's just it can feel a bit didactic and it can feel like, especially without the songs to back it up. Like I'm not saying those songs aren't on here, but like I said this in the Drake episode and maybe it's a craven way to think about it. But at this point in the career of a pop artist with such a body of work, I'm thinking like, what of these songs are going to make it in this live set list five years from now? Right. What are these songs? And, and how are you going to feel when they push out an old favorite? And it, what's going to be on the two disc greatest hits? And maybe that's maybe that's it's an old idea. It's an old idea, but it is. But it's in like, the era's era. It's an old idea. Sure, but maybe the assumption or the presumption of importance is somehow outweighing, like on the song level. Like I, agree. I don't like Daddy Lessons. I agree. To me, is much more successful. I agree. Daddy than the vast majority much... of stuff and doing the same thing. I totally agree. It does. It felt. I mean. Organic is like a overly wasted word, but Daddy Lessons felt like an organic meeting of the minds, especially in the live performance where you have the, the former Dixie Chicks, now Chicks. Um, it speaks a real comfort. It's a comfortable song. Yeah. Um, Feels natural. A, a lot of songs on this record, there are both, to me, songs that feel frisky and also comfortable, but then there are songs that feel, I mean, you use the word didactic. To me, I would say they feel very written. Mm -hmm. I feel the writing in the songs. And one of the things about Beyonce as a singer is I think she's like an excellent singer, yeah. especially when she allows herself the freedom to really run. And when I said in the beginning that there's something kind of like 70s singer-songwriter and a tiny bit small to me, especially in the middle portion of this record, I kept being like, "What? where's the singing? Like the singing? Like I... I would like something bigger. And I do wonder, you know, I don't want to spend too much time thinking about like authorial intent. Like it's like, that's not, I have a whole riff that I'd prepped about originalism and the Supreme court and like the intention of the author and the intention of the text. I had like a whole thing, but on a basic level, if you're going to at least give 5% of your brain over to like, why did Beyonce make, this set of songs. When she wants you to be thinking like that. I She's mean, it's clear. Being forceful with Yes, that. but if you're, if you're gonna be spending some energy thinking about the whys of it, um, it's not, a, it doesn't feel like it's about singing. It, it feels like it's about making a point to, I hate to say it, but to people who have historically marginalized and undersold the quality, these kinds of qualities that have always been in her music. Right. It's not as if these kinds of qualities weren't there five, 10 or this even 15 or, the Scorsese point. Yeah, five, 10 or even 15 or 20 years ago. It's the literal. And I think you're right about the press release and the explaining, but what do you lose when you have to explain it? Like who's the explaining for is it for young people who maybe didn't grow up with a bunch of these records to understand the broad context? Valid. Yeah. Is it for 60 year old white Grammy voters to be like, okay, I can find my way into this record. Valid. Right. But, but again, yeah. that's a, that's a homework. It, whether that functions as music or functions as an album is a different kind of thing. And you know, there are songs on this album that I genuinely really think are great. Yeah, let's talk. We should talk yeah. about that. Um, I like Daughter a lot. Yeah, interesting. Can we listen to Daughter? They keep saying that ain't nothing like my father, but I'm the furthest thing from quiet boys and altars. If you cross me, I'm just like my father. I am colder than Titanic water. Help me, Lord, from these fantasies in my head. They ain't never been safe ones. I don't fellowship with these fake ones. So let's travel to White Chapels and sing. I couldn't quite get my arms around this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't follow the storytelling, to be honest. And I wish there was a little bit more. Like, 
for me, hearing the singles on the album, they're really strong. I think they're, they're so really much, strong. Especially 16 Carriages. 16 Carriages. So much, so much stronger on the album. That is, to me, that's the perfect version of what, be, like, that is the next step from Daddy Lessons, mm-hmm. uh, is a song like 16 Carriages. It's like... I mean, it's not Levi Jeans. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're going to talk about Levi Jeans. Girl, I want to take you home. That I'm like, oh wow, like this works. It's playing with the genre, but it's telling mm-hmm. your story. And Daughter, I feel like I had a, it, I found it a little bit more slippery, but it's very interesting sonically. Which, like, again, like this is Beyonce. Like, are we gonna deny her like the prodigiousness of like the the making of these songs? Like, mm-hmm. of course, the level is like really is like mm-hmm. like she's only competing with herself. Like, yes, um, nobody else is making albums like this in the mainstream. Mm-hmm. And that's the only reason we can even talk about it at this level. So I'm not, you know, I'm not slighting that, but I'm saying like some some things are are more successful than others. But talk about daughter. Yeah, I mean, I I hear what you're saying about the lyrics, but I do think what one thing I like about it, I don't necessarily need it to be a fully coherent story. What I do think my most favorite version of casual Beyonce is like the kind of like tossed off tisk tisk. Beyonce, I think there's like a lot of that in this, uh, in the lyrics of this song. Like I, I hear an embedded attitude yeah. that to me, that's the sort of like glue that holds it together more than like a narrative through line. Anytime I'm looking for like narrative through lines on most of these songs, eh, there are some that are like very like, in, almost like on Monday this happened on Tuesday. Like there's a little bit of that, but to me, that's not the sales pitch, at least for the songs that hold up. The most for me. Tisk Tisk on Jolene. Oh, geez. Uh, Jolene working for you? Let's listen to Jolene first. Jolene, 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 Jolene. I'm warning you, woman, find you your own man. Jolene, I know I'm a queen. Jolene, I'm still a pre old banjo bitch from Louisiana. So as has been uh, made clear on the internet multiple times uh, in the last week or two, Dolly Parton herself has said in the past that she wished that Beyonce would cover Jolene. Uh, Of all the covers, she wished Beyonce would cover Jolene, probably because the publishing checks would be amazing. (laughs) Um, uh, She's got the I will always love you check. That's true. That's true. (laughs) We see you, Dolly. Also, Dolly, come on podcast logs. We we sent the email. Um, this is not a cover of Jolene. Well, it's not. It's a rewording and also reattituding yeah. of Jolene. The original Jolene is um, sung from the perspective of someone whose partner uh, is being uh, moved in on. Someone is sliding in the DMs. <laughs> Whatever you did in the 60s or 70s to slide in the DMs, uh, the DMs are being slid in. And uh, you, as the person who's that person's partner, is feeling anxious and unsettled and insecure and worried that this incredibly alluring alternate option. Right. There's a lot of love also. There, there's like it's hate incredible. and love in equal measure in the original yeah. Jolene. Um, and this this anxiety that this other uh, tantalizing but attractive unknown quantity can disrupt the sense of calm and peace that you have. That is not what this version of Jolene no. is. This version is the I'm a queen. I'm she getting says I'm yeah. getting the hammer out. Yeah. Um, this is <laughs> can we say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she says she it. She says basically. it. Um, yeah, this version is about I will do you violence. Yeah. This is not I am uncertain of where I stand. This is not I am on unsteady territory. This is not I think I might lose my man. This is actually like it's not. Me, Jolene is like the singer versus the interloper. This is about the power couple versus the interloper, which is something that Beyonce has touched on previously. Right, it is. And Dolly alludes to. It's both a a retread of Lemonade, basically. Yes, of course. You Mm -hmm. know, um, it's a story we know Mm -hmm. from from this artist. Um, But it's it and it's like it's it's a pretty audacious swing to flip Jolene in that way. 
uh, Tim, okay, I think I like it a little more than you, but I it doesn't. I don't want to pretend. Calling it a cover of Jolene is wrong. I wonder, in this particular musical, cultural, and historical moment, how a Beyonce cover of Jolene would hit. I don't know that people would connect with it. I think because that energy of right, vulnerability, you wouldn't buy, you wouldn't buy it. it doesn't feel true to the overall Beyonce project. This is a Beyonce filtered version of that kind of interaction. I mostly like it. I think it's good, but I don't mistake it for uh, an emotional or literal cover of the original. Sure. It's interesting because there are a lot of, you know, Jolene sort of sp spins throughout history and like Cam, who, country's country yes. singer, who's on this album on has this album. one. It doesn't super work for me sonically. Like I don't love mm -hmm. the phrasing or the, or the production of the, of the mm -hmm. Jolene flip. Um, but it just really takes me like the, the, the robbing of the plaintiveness of the original just takes me out of it. And like, just plainly, like it's too obvious. Like, it's Dolly, a, well, there's like, a lot of obvious like, things on this record. It's just, nobody needs to cover Jolene on an album that is, or isn't about country music. Okay. But to pick up on what I was saying before, like, and, and just briefly sidebar, is this Beyonce saying to the Grammys? I dare you. Won't, you. <laughs> yeah. Like literally you won't give it to me for lemonade. You won't give it to me for Renaissance. Never mind whatever came four before. Yeah. or whatever. Yeah. All great records. Self-titled. Right. Self-titled. Like you, B-Day. You whatever. Like, but, like, yeah. but if I make a record referencing like five or to ten of the most important like quote unquote with white songs. With real instruments. With real instruments, white songs of all time in genres that you Grammy voters really dig. I dare you. I, is that what this is? And if the answer is yes, is that of why do that? Who's that for? For like the mantle, you know, it's like the LeBron Jamesification, the like creating your legacy in real time. Like, and that's fine. Like, you know, she showed up when she became the winningest Grammy person she did. both times. Yes. When she tied, when she won, you know, Jay gave that speech this year. Was that the beginning of this campaign? Like these people are, you know, they are very methodical. Like yes. we know how this works. It's interesting that, we ha now have confirmation that this album has been in the works not only since the pandemic, but five years mm -hmm. predating the pandemic. Seems like it was going to be before Renaissance. She said she had to put out the dance one to sort of rouse Uplift, people yeah. after mm -hmm. COVID. Um, but this is, and she said, you know, I recorded a hundred songs for this. Like this is, this is a project that that she has worked over many times. And I do think it's okay to have an end goal in mind when you're this far into your career. But again, just on a, as a pure listening experience, you know, uh, you get to something like Jolene, and I felt the same way, honestly, about using "I Feel Love" uh, on Renaissance yeah. and the outro of Renaissance. Like, okay, we get it; it's a dance album. Like, yeah. there's a million Donna Summer references that we've heard fewer times. Yeah, it's sort and of. I don't um, know if your spin is enough to make it worth and playing also this card. to get back to the kind of sampling conversation, which is if you think about the '80s into the '90s. There was a moment, and, and it's not a clean break from one phase to the next, but there's, like, the obscure sample moment. There's the crate digging moment of, like, not only can I take— I pulled this. Yeah, yeah, and not only can I take uh, a fragment of a pre-existing thing and build an entirely new thing atop it, it's also I did it off a thing you've never heard of. And that is the musicality. That's what's inherently musical about what I did is I found this thing, I remade it, I, ma I built it from scratch, and 40 years from now, DJ Jazzy Jeff is going to uh, play it live, uh, like figure out the sample live and like blow people's minds because they haven't figured it out, right? Um, so there's that. And then there's the, the Puffy era and the Dr. Dre era and of like incredibly big, obvious samples. Uh, which turned hip hop into global pop. Um, I'm not saying one of those is right and sure. one of those is wrong, but they do feel like two different approaches to musicality. And so it's strange to me because I fundamentally believe Beyonce probably has listened to all the stuff yep. and has done all the homework and the all cuts. the researching. She gets it. I believe that. Given that, these are strange choices to me. And they do feel like a tiny bit of a taunt. Good to like vibrations a, is another yeah, one. Yeah, good vibrations. It, it does feel like a tiny bit of a taunt to a hypothetical Grammy voter. She's picking up the vibrations.
sensations. He's looking for sweet sensations. Ladies. Yeah. Where it's like, I literally covered the Beatles. The I do Beach think boys are on this. Record. I don't want to go too far and say that there are not subtle illusions here. You know, like a song that really works for me on this album is is Bodyguard, which yeah. has like a lot of live bass. And it's I think yeah, it's, it's Raphael Sadiq. Sadiq. Yeah. Uh, and there's like Motown references there. I think there's like even like a Neil Young song that they're sort of nodding to. Um, I saw mentioned in a review. I think that was Carl Wilson on Slate who mm-hmm. called that one out. Like there is stuff. There is deeper stuff to pull here. You, you know, there's an underworld sample like that's mm-hmm. a, like. Only Beyonce is going to sing Good Vibrations and sample Underworld mm-hmm. in at this level. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of stuff. In, there's a lot of in-your-face stuff. What uh, else What else works for you besides Bodyguard? Because Bodyguard, to me, is could have appeared on almost like five other prior Beyonce which albums. Which is one of the reasons yeah. that I like it, I think. It's it's a, it's like feels like a hit. Classic, by, and it's it, classic. Classic Beyonce. Yeah. I think the back half of this album is stronger than the front half. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I think Two Hands to Heaven, to yes. me, uh, this is a time where the double eyes mean two instead of just I. Yeah. Um, just the inconsistency of the style guide bothers me. <laughs> um, but We're sending it to standards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this song has... A lot of different pieces. It yeah. feels like it feels virtuosic. Yeah, in a way that only Beyonce can 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 pull off. It feels like she she's. It plays with tempo. It plays with texture. It plays with singing versus rapping. It plays with different kinds of singing versus other different kinds of singing. All within like you know forty five seconds span. Um, it's that's a song to me that also. Frankly, could have been on prior Beyonce projects to my ear. But would have been a standout on any Beyonce project. It's um, vocally strong. It's like if you have come this far in the episode and you're a person who's still like, I don't understand what Beyonce does well, listen to this. Like, let's play a little bit of it because this is what Beyonce does well. 16 switches, candy, apple, green, candy, paint, swirling 24 inch spinners. Swirl. Don't judge me, baby. (laughs) You would never judge me, baby. That whole stretch, I think, River Dance, you know, that that's like a more interesting mm-hmm. Dolly reference to me than than just doing Jolene. You like Yaya? Up. Yeah, yeah, um, like, yeah. It's is that, good, it's good is Tina that gonna be the is that gonna be the standout track of this? It's a good Tina Turner song, right? Yeah, right. Like, and which it's a good Tina Turner you know, that's yeah. that's Beyonce's yeah. queen mm-hmm. as as it should be. Um it, it was interesting to see seems like some of this stuff got added after. I think Yaya's not on the vinyl, which the fans and, Or the, the pre-order CD. Yeah. We got a couple emails about that, and then I was looking online, and it seems that a lot of people... So basically, I think if you pre-ordered the vinyl or the CD, you do not have the final version of the right. album. You right. have, like, a earlier pre-clearance version which of the like, album. Which, like, welcome to the streaming. It's Beyonce. Like, she's yeah. not going to stop futzing. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of good stuff on here. Okay, the two duets... Is it 4D chess for Beyonce to feature two artists, Miley Cyrus and Post Malone, who have tried on genre like a costume, specifically black genres, and now are moving into their very white phases? Is that, or are they just popular artists who appear on this album? Um, I felt more that way with the Post Malone song than with the Miley song. Although I think Miley's pivot is even more known and dramatic. No, no, I, it's, I, I agree, but I I guess to me, hearing Beyonce and Miley sing together felt more natural to me. Like, I felt like it was a better musical choice. Whereas hearing Post Malone, who like, part of the reason that Post Malone can be effective in all these spaces is there's something fundamentally neutral about Post Malone. <laughs> Okay. Like I, I like I think that, you know it. he has soft edges. He has yeah. there's fuzz, and I mean this vocally. Yeah. Um. Uh. You know I saw I was watching or someone on Twitter or TikTok was just talking about like what an incredible singer Post Malone is, and I was like, it's interesting because like that's both true and not true. He's like incredibly. There's a lot of technical gift, but he has he forever sounds like like he's singing behind a wall. Like, there's always something between your ear and his vocal. And so 
having him on the same song as Beyonce, one of the most present singers of the last 20 years, that doesn't quite quite hit the same. Whereas Miley, you can argue, is like sometimes too far in front of the like too far out in front. Right. So she doesn't need the microphone. Yeah, yeah. Like so, but but hearing the two of them play against each other is actually to me much better. So I I like what you're saying. I'm I'm even thinking it might be true. I think it's true. I've, yeah. I've been thinking about it a lot, and I was like, oh, like it's a funny coincidence, or like you know, these two they get away with murder, and now I'm like, nah, like Beyonce doesn't. So do, how come Kid Rock is not on this do album? Much by and how come Kid Rock is not on this album? <laughs> he missed the studio session. He definitely missed the studio session. He and the Dream did not yeah. get along. <laughs> um, who else would be in that category? Of someone who could be on this. Oh, well, MGK. Yeah, that's what MGK. I was talking about at the beginning. You know, it's like you want to you want to be black or you want to be white in terms of genre right now. Um, is there someone else? I'm trying to think. Jelly Roll. Yeah. Why isn't Jelly Roll on this record? That would be a good duet partner. That would genuine, like an actually good duet. Yeah. And then there are the upcoming black artists features, mostly who in are the not country genre. Yes, who are not on Blackbird. Right. You got Shibuzi. Yeehaw Future. <laughs> has, what, two two features on this album? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the duet with Willie Jones. Um, less just successful. For fun. Less successful. Yeah, to me. like, yeah. I, this is the thing. I'm like, as a gesture, I get it. And it's huge. And like, especially because going back, like, Beyonce has gotten flack. One of the few things she's gotten flack for is like borrowing liberally from smaller artists mm -hmm. and not putting them on. You know, it makes me think of like conversations around Rosalia, like professional. Cultural appropriators, yes. collage artists. Yes. Some of the best artists of our time are accused of that the wildly. O the auteurs Drake, of that. of course. Yeah. Um, so for her to take these guys and give them shine, like, that's very meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm like, Shibuzi's not good enough to be on a Beyonce album. Yeah. To me. I don't yeah. need to hear. Is he good enough to be on a future record? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to, like, I don't, I, I don't know if you disagree, but I'm just like, mm -hmm. I don't come to this level of project yes. to hear this guy. It's like, I, it's, I I felt the same sort of about Willie Jones, who I think has had some success, uh, but I think from a vocal power perspective, again, it's not a feel, fair fight. Yeah, no, it's not a fair. I think it's exactly right. Yeah. Um, but then there's, you know, we can go out with uh, another one of my favorites, unless you yeah, want to throw go one for it. I think Alligator Tears, that's a song with the dream that's oh, like that's interesting. more in the, that to me, I prefer it to you shouted out daughter and I'm like I think that they're sort of playing in the same interesting this is, this is one of my one of my least favorite uh, all right yeah, um, yeah but I'm but go for it yeah what do you what do you dislike about it um it there's a that run of songs uh right before and after alligator I mean, tears spaghetti we shouldn't talk about the Thanos yeah, line it's that's some of the her which worst, line the Thanos line uh, some of her worst yeah, rapping yeah. um to me when I'm talking about like the singer songwriter stuff I think the sort of parallel thing or the kind of accompanying thing I'm saying is there's a dourness. Mm. And I, I think, you know, Beyonce is so fundamentally alive that anytime I hear something that feels a little dour, I'm just like, this feels, this is an odd choice. Even if it's a proactive choice, it still doesn't feel totally in line with the gifts. And this was like kind of in the middle of a run that I felt like was, took the energy down um, didn't feel as sophisticated as some of the other songs we talked about in terms of complexity. I don't know, but tell me what you like about it. I think it's an, an original sound. I think it's like a mm. new twist. Like I, it, it makes me. It, it's the kind of song that makes me stop and think, like, what it, what is she doing here in a yeah. in a big musical buffet? You mm -hmm. know, and like I would have in a, a more concentrated version of this album. Like I would have liked to hear her with like a lot of acoustic, like just doing acoustic guitar singer song sure. stuff, but with a Beyonce twist. Right. And I think this goes, to fully lean into yes, that. Yes, and I think yeah. this goes down that direction. Speaking of Yeehaw Future, is actual future Yeehaw Future? Not yet, but he'll he'll, 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 he'll he'll do it at some point. Future Miley Beyonce on a fake Lil Nas X song. Future and Miley have a song together, right? Yes, no, I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I'm saying what I'd like is like, you know, we're not that far off. Future might be the only artist to collaborate with Beyonce, Taylor, Taylor Swift, Swift, and Miley Cyrus. And Kendrick Lamar. And Kendrick Lamar, which, let's just go in. 
if you would have asked me two weeks ago the the thing I want least on a future album, I might say a Kendrick Lamar verse. And yet he shows up yeah. and he fits in. Yeah. On this song. We're talking about like that. Yeah. By future and Metro Boomin featuring mm-hmm. Kendrick Lamar. Yes. Talking out of their neck. Don't put no coughing out of your mouth. I'm way too paranoid for a threat. Hey, hey, let's get it, bro. BOT, the money power respect. The last one is better. Say yes, a lot of goofies with a check. I mean, oh, I hope them sentiments symbolic. Oh, my temperament bipolar, I choose violence. Okay, let's get it up. It's time for him to prove that he's a pro. With the everlasting bass sample. Yes. With Rodney O and Joe Cooley. Rodney O and Joe Cooley. Yeah. You may know. From Wayne using it, you may know mm-hmm. from E40 using mm-hmm. it. I I like this song. I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think I did. I didn't think, like I said, Kendrick could fit here. It's there's a lot of things like Beyonce. This album is created with a lot of moments that are meant to be screenshot yes. and discursive. There's the prodigy samples yes. throughout of him mm-hmm. talking trash, which the greatest of mm-hmm. all time, maybe, at doing mm-hmm. that. Um, Stop questioning my taste making. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yes, we could. We go all day. Rest in peace. Um, but all the obvious samples that seem aimed at a particular <laughs> Canadian Type. former yes. collaborator, mm-hmm. uh, and like the the stunt of getting Kendrick on this. Like at first, I thought the song was a stunt, and now a week or so later, I'm like, oh, it works. It works and, on the album, and, it, and yeah. you see it. Like this song is not. This song is popular. The song is legitimately popular. Yes. It's number one. It's going to be the number one song in America this week. It's probably going to be the number one song in America next week, even though the Beyonce album came out. Mm-hmm. Like the song, it's, it, it's, I think it's working. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> dun, dun. Um, what about okay. you? Okay. But this album, look, separate from this song, this is an incredibly good album. You love I it. really it's the like the first future album you've loved in a long time. It really is. Like, Me too. I, Since I think, like Hendrix, maybe? Yeah, I feel like at the was it last year that they did the vinyl box set of all the mixtapes? Yeah, end of last year. Yeah. yeah. So like I hadn't listened to the mixtapes in a while. So I went back to listen to the mixtapes. Um for the record, if you buy the vinyl, some songs are missing because I guess they weren't clear. Sure. But whatever. Uh I went back to listen to the tapes. It's just like, damn. Yeah. So, I mean. Monster, beast unbelievable, mode, just an nights. unbelievable run, right? That the future of like twenty eighteen onwards or seventeen onwards is maybe not that future. Who this, could be? Yeah, yeah, but this is maybe as close. Maybe he had to like step away for a while. He did. To he get took back a little bit that, of a break. Yeah, to get back in that bag a tiny bit. But like this, this future, chef's kiss. Really, no notes. I don't know if that's Metro giving him the right beats. I don't know if it's a psychological like warfare I, with a former collaborator well, yes of course <laughs> but like i do is it a headspace thing is it a beat thing i'm not entirely sure i do think these are some of metro's best beats in a while yeah, yeah. so but i think it's some of future's best rapping in a while i think this is an incredibly successful album and yet why is all that anyone is talking about the kendrick thing I mean, and I, I, it's not that I don't understand, yeah. but, but this is when we're talking about meta narratives and we're talking about discourse. Like, obviously, I'm happy that people are talking about this album, but they're not really talking about this album. Right. This album is a successful album, top to bottom. Yep. People aren't talking about yeah. that. They're just talking about this one moment or two or three moments. Yep. And maybe that's just how music marketing functions now. And even as a great auteur artist, you have to think of two, three, 50, 75, 500 touch points for people to talk about. Maybe that's how it works. But it's frustrating to me because I think when people look back on this album, they're going to think Kendrick. And I wish that when people look back on this album, they'll be like, damn, Future was really back on his back. Here's what I'm going to say. Future albums that are good have legs, and I do think sure that but they're like sub Rosa legs, uh, but they're like outside legs. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, they're yeah. like car test legs. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. like club legs. Yeah, they're yeah. like okay. down south radio legs. Mm-hmm. Like sure. you're gonna hear these songs all summer. I think we'll see what happens with the next album they're putting out, like in two weeks or Is whatever. That, that's confirmed. Yeah, April twelfth, yeah. I think. Um, which let's go. Yeah. Like they, they must have another, another thing planned, but I do think it took that 
little Easter egg to go back to the earlier conversation. It took that shift in the meta narrative to get people back to being excited about a future album. Like he puts out so much music, you know, unlike Beyonce, but similarly to Drake, he's, he's not really changing his subject matter. He's not really changing his sound, uh, over the years, Yeah, but he's not really criticized for it because you know what you're getting when you come to future, but you do need that one little extra thing to be like, and in the mixtape run, that extra thing was the disillusion of his relationship with Sierra yeah. and his return to a villain status. Yes. And even if it's subtle and you can sort of project it onto everything. Like you, once you realize that he might be on bad terms with Drake and certainly Metro Boomin is, uh, you can, you can try to project that. You're a number the one fan dog of, of, I mean, yeah, he calls Drake his number one fan on the first song. On the also, album. should we put the article that I did after the Apollo show or is Drake is rap's biggest fan? I mean, should we just, Future, do you think Future has a subscription? The, the do, you, reason, do you have a subscription? Do you the, have a login? The reason you play why Wordle? the diss is good, that diss specifically, is because it's correct. Yes. Like, tra- like, when you say something true about someone, that's when it really mm-hmm. works. So to me, honestly, the Future shot at Drake, if that's in fact what it is at the beginning of that, that mm-hmm. album is more potent than, than anything Kendrick. Kendrick says. Yeah, I will say this. About- can we unpa- I want to unpack the Kendrick verse a little bit. Okay. And then we'll talk about how people are unpacking the Kendrick verse. Okay. The, I don't know the meme. Is it the Arnold meme with the fist? That's Arthur. Sorry. You're not a millennial. <laughs> Arnold? Do you know the difference between Arnold and Arthur? No. <laughs> Whatever. The fist meme? That's the Kendrick verse. It's so like... <laughs> that, that, I mean... Yeah. No, I know, but like... Come on, man. Just make another classic record. Like, like what are we doing here? Like, it's, I don't, you don't like him in that mode. I know I do, but I'm just like, dudes are lapping you. Like they're making outstanding records or they're making huge hits. And I understand that the, the fundamental premise of Kendrick is I don't play that game. Yeah. I don't do that. Yeah. I absolutely understand that. But it's like, when you're like, there's no big three, it's just big me. It's just like a little, like, like I just, there's something about it that feels um, inappropriately testy. It's, it's just like, it's kind of like, well, he did that with control. Obviously. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's day. a thing. Yeah. And I understand like Kendrick is invested in that conversation in a way that frankly, a lot of guys of my generation are invested yep. in that conversation. Like, how dare you mention those guys alongside. Right. Like, it, yeah. And it's like, I, I, I get it. I, I grew up in that environment hip hop is a rappers sport. yeah like rappers going to each other constantly like i get it um and i understand that drake is also like the master of the sneak disc like he's doing it but he's not doing it yeah. but he's doing it um so it's not that drake is above or beneath or kendrick is above or anything they just do it in very different ways yeah. but there is something like lightly petulant about the way kendrick does it and i would almost say that the way drake I mean, hasn't responded yet, maybe never will, but there'll be like some incredibly elegant dance of a thing in the middle of a number one hit three years from now. That'll be like, oh, and it's just, they're playing two different games. It's like college ball and pro ball or like softball and baseball. They're just like Prince and Michael Jackson. Prince. So this to me, that's the, that's the real line. It's like, he's getting at what you're getting at, but I want to unpack it because he says, uh, huh. Kendrick says, in reference, presumably, to him and Drake, who is constantly referencing Michael Jackson, Yes, Prince outlived Mike Jack. Now, taken literally, they both had unfortunate demises. They met unfortunate ends, substance-related deaths. Uh, He didn't outlive him by that long. The music that he made (laughs) in the time after Michael Jackson, just, it's a... It doesn't really hold up to scrutiny, oh, but you know what he means? I know what he means. It's interesting. He means, like, I'm an artist and you're a pop star. Michael Jackson was an artist. Of course. That's why I'm saying it doesn't really... It's like it's the best line in the verse to me, but it also doesn't really hold up when you look at it close. Like, he's trying to say the thing that you're saying, which is we play different games. Like, you can have your number one hits. Mm-hmm. I'll just pop out and be a but genius. This is, but this is what people always get wrong about Drake 
Mm-hmm. And yeah. you would think Kendrick would be an astute enough listener to not get it wrong about right. Drake. And obviously, like, there's a difference between like what you know and what you put in a verse. They can be sure. different. But it's like the thing that people fundamentally get wrong about Drake is reducing him to yep. statistics and success. He does that a little bit to himself. I, yeah, but it's like if I had those statistics sure. and success, I probably would as well. Right. Um, but a lot of times people weaponize that against his yep. artistry. Yep. And Drake is fundamentally truly one of the most artistically successful huge pop stars yes, of the 21st similar century. Similar to Michael Jackson. <laughs> yes, uh, 21st century. Um, you know, what Kendrick is saying, obviously, is like, we talked about auteurs before. He's like, I'm the auteur, and you're the sort of frivolous guy. It's not true. About either of those guys or right. about either of these guys. Also, like, Prince was quite prolific, <laughs> I will say. Extremely. And, and, and like, frankly, late in career, to very mixed effect. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I, there's just a lot of late prints that's like, you know, yep. uh, which is not great. That said, uh, I once watched Prince play in a room genuinely not much bigger than this room, like maybe twice the size of this room for like four hours. It was unreal. Yep. Like, it was like, it's not Beyonce at Coachella, but like, just because it couldn't possibly be, but like for a show as of that size, gets, yeah, un unfathomably good sure astonishing yeah um so i've no knocks on prince and fundamentally i have no knocks on kendrick i just like this mode of kendrick it's like but do you think it's a warning shot though like it's like i don't know but he wants it's just like get drake out to play it just the thing about great beef effective beef in hip-hop or elsewhere is the sense that the two people who are beefing are plausibly facing off in the same space obviously not in the same room but in the same space their levels are at the same like they're they're facing each other this kendrick verse and frankly control which like is the type of thing that people lose their minds over but they largely are losing their minds over because nobody does it anymore so like someone does it and you're like oh right right. but the thing about this how to rob thing yes exactly saying names yes basically the thing about this verse, and and also control, but to me, this verse, because of how late in their careers it's coming, it doesn't feel like Kendrick and Drake are facing each other. You don't think they're peers. I, it's not that they're not peers. It's just that Kendrick feels like he's commenting on a thing that he is on the outside of. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. Like, I'm not saying that that's not valid or an approach, but it makes it feel, to me, stakesless. Like, it's not like, you know, all the sort of follow up posts about Drake of like a live show. It's like, Drake's not bothered. Like, Drake's this. Yeah, Drake's this. I mean, and maybe he is, maybe he's not. I don't know. But like, if those are right, Drake's not bothered because it's like, it's the definition of like, you're on the outside of the club and you can't get in. That's how this feels. But as what of, if the which push is why it's the fist. like, push a T way further from Drake than Kendrick in any sort of like, but clearly knew, but space. clearly is so well connected and connected to Kanye and sure. knows certain information that was weaponized sure. against Drake. That's a different kind of insiderness. Yeah. Kendrick, obviously, much more successful than Pusha yeah, T. Pusha as an was artist. like guerrilla warfare. It's like Kendrick is delivering essayistic commentary on the rap game in the in the shape of a Drake diss. Yeah. Um, Pusha T is like, I'm coming for your neck. <laughs> yeah. Like I I, w- I wish you gone. <laughs> right. And that, to me, is not exactly what's happening on this verse. So to me, the interesting thing about this verse, even more so than the verse itself, is the conversation it's generated. This goes back to what we're talking about with Beyonce. And it also touches on a thread, I think, of pop fandom, standom even, Mm -hmm. that is especially pernicious right now, which is that everything is QAnon. Everything is like... You know, the the yarn on the wall with the pictures and like this means that and this means that and this is actually a reference to that. And like people are losing their minds. Like you saw the clip uh, from uh, uh, Dissect Pod that was like, actually, here's all the layers to the Kendrick verse. But Goofy's with a check is also a Drake diss with Goofy being a cartoon dog, a play on for all my dogs and a check being the logo for Nike who Drake collabs with. Kendrick is calling Drake Goofy. 
a non-threatening dog that's popular but not feared. I mean, it's it's the geniusification yes. of rap understanding. It's the dissectification of rap understanding. Yep. It's the so sense, literal. The what? <laughs> it's so literal. It's so literal, and also it it suggests that the full understanding of a piece of music is reduced to. I get the reference right. or I recognize the reference. And this is also what we're talking about with the Beyonce thing. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's like Beyonce is being very deliberate and being like, here are the loudest possible. I'm painting with primary colors. It's the loudest possible reference points so that everybody can be like, I see the reference points. Yeah. And again, you can do that and make great music or you can do that and make mid music or bad music. It, it's not inherently connected to quality. Sure. But it is connected to volume of discourse and content and the presumption that if you have successfully referenced A, B, C, and D, that you're doing a good thing. And this is where, I mean, I was joking before about like originalism and kind of like Supreme Court, but it's like a lot of these reads feel like originalist reads of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, the same people who are getting pumped about getting the references are probably the same kind of people who are like, I wish the Supreme Court would not deliver originalist <laughs> reads on the Constitution. Far, I'm yeah. just saying, think about it. Give it some thought. Uh, that's all you I'm had, saying. You had to get that. I'm to just get saying, give it some thought. Yeah. I'm just saying. But to me, it makes a certain kind of listener or fan feel like they solved it. Yeah. And music is not to be solved. Right. It's not a puzzle yeah. to be solved. My favorite. It, it, I, I just, I hate the idea yeah. that like somehow if you follow this thread to this link to that thread, that you understand everything about a piece of music. Yeah. That could not be farther from the truth. Right. My favorite one of these is the track titles, like that every mm -hmm. track title is sort of answer. Is a sort of like answer to a Drake. Uh, track title mm -hmm. and then you reference like you know Drake gives these speeches on stage every night on tour and people are like oh he's responding to Kendrick and then other people are like no no Drake does this every night yes. you know like there's there's a lot a lot of content but also it works like it really works and they both play into it you know the uh, the IG captions is another one Drake does dumb little rhymey IG captions yes. all the time he's not doing them now instead of making an answer no of diss course. track but then, like, they play into it because, like, I don't know if you saw last night, LeBron rapped along to the Kendrick verse during pregame warm-ups. All the blogs post it. That's one, that's one cycle of content. One then Drake, one. shout out to Elliot Wilson, taps the like button on the post of the clip of LeBron, his best pal, his, mm -hmm. you know, his, his I'm LeBron. He's, mm -hmm. you know, like, so they play into it and it really works. Like, this future album is extremely successful. The highest selling future album. But if this song other was than not out of time to be alive. But if it, this song was not on the future album, it would still be incredibly successful. And I don't know about that. I it would be good, but I don't know that it would be as successful. Like you mean commercially? Yes. And it's still and, a great album. So it's still a great album. Let's go out. We'll just do what 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 on this album is. No, I mean we, yeah, we, we barely talked about the Mob Deep stuff. Yeah. Like seen it all. Like obviously, it's a great record. Me and my brothers, we been free in rotation. Sometimes they move on, they still can't replace. I lose a star to get replaced the same day. For trapping out my granny house for rapping on the stage. I want it all, I know these streets gonna have to feed me. The whole stun I'm letting them hit it off the whole key. It's nice to hear future rapping on a beat like that. That's so like out of his typical comfort zone. Like you don't think of future, like a lot of um you know, you think of like the radio freestyle of just like rappers going to the LA leakers or whatever and being like, I can rap on anything. I can rap on a, a Nas beat. I can rap on a dub C in the mad circle beat, whatever. Future's never been a guy that's like going to go up to the radio station and rap on a random New York beat. Sure. So it's nice to hear. Yeah. Like I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Um, Ice Attack. Yeah. I mean, the Cinderella. Cinderella, incredible. She the, a vibe. Fried the, she a vibe. Fried. Fried she the a back vibe. half of this album. So good. Where My Twin At, incredible. To me, the real oh, that's, stand that's one I, I That's one of my least favorites. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's one of my to, least favorites. There is some beat variation, on, like you're yeah. saying, uh, hearing Future on like a New York style beat. 
Um, but also Everyday Hustle, uh, yeah. with him doing like a ornate Rick Ross yes. style beat yeah. with Ross, mm-hmm. another person who Drake has been, mm-hmm. you know, maybe sparring with uh, low key for Did a while. Did Ross actually unfollow Drake, or was that just like some? See, stitched? I don't know. Did Drake actually invite Rick Ross's ex to his concert the following night? Like, it seems seems like he did. I don't know. <laughs> like, but this is the stuff. And then you get the people looking back at old Drake songs and Drake verses in a new light, sort of being like, "Oh, he saw this coming." No, but like even just seeing how excited you are right now, I love it. But it's stressing me out. But I love it because. It adds a little bit of stakes and fun for Drake and Future, two of my favorite artists who might be like it plateauing, you know, who are just like, well, what am I like? Drake's still going to be rapping about Kanye. No, he has new fire. He has new and Future That's has fine. new I, like it's just a, that little twist of motivation. So you're saying it's indivisible that Future needs the meta antagonism in order to deliver an album of this level of qual- this level yes. of quality. And it's yeah, it's like again to keep with the sports parallels. It's like the in-season tournament. It's like they just added one more little layer of competition to allow people who are great but so successful that they don't have that I, much to go I off I guess of. what I would say is I, have, I am completely confident that both Future and Drake and Kendrick and whatever have made music premised upon actual tensions and fraughtness in their personal and professional lives. That's been mid- Fine, but also you're saying this is the best future album in a while, so it could Abs- be a coincidence, could not. And the last thing I'll say about why it like gets me going that these yeah. two are going at each other is like your point about Kendrick Lamar, where he's like not actually in the same space as Drake. Like, future is a good foil for him. Uh, that I totally agree with. And like, if should it come to actual all out like song warfare. I would much rather hear all out song warfare between Drake and Future than between Drake and Kendrick. Or even just five years of subs. It's fine. It's too. fine too. Should we go out with a future song from this segment? Better than a tweet about a future song. <laughs> yeah. Why are you upset? It's fun. It's just <laughs> fine. Just play the song. <laughs> What do you want to hear? Right, we're going to play Everyday Hustle. Meet me at the nearest coat spot. Middle of the slum, standing at the boat dock. Loading up cash, moving in the U-Haul. Went inside my bag when I took a roof off. Let's talk about songs. You I go think, first, because I'm got i too worked up already. I can't are you go sure? Into but my I think actually yet. your song is actually like, this is the energy level for your <laughs> song. Right, let's just do it. Go we, in. We should have done the whole episode on this. It's, we could have done a five-part series on this. I love it. Camila Cabello. Featuring Playboy Cardi and Gucci Man, <laughs> finally came out after what felt like months of teasing. Totally confused. What is this rebrand? Why is she doing this? Can what, I also what time signature is this song yes. in? <laughs> Can I briefly acknowledge um, uh, our friends at Nymphet Alumni who posted a hilarious meme about the consensual hyperpop rebrand, <laughs> which we'll show here. Uh, shout out to y'all. I don't know if they made the meme or just found the meme, but anyway, uh, also shout out to our our friend Addison Ray. This song and video dropped. It's. This is what I want out of popular music. Yeah. It's It's all ideas from the underground. Yeah. Boiled up. Or not really. Or not really. Yeah, or not really. Taken by El Guincho, a collaborator of Rosalia, who, Mm -hmm. like, invented more of this stuff than whoever else you think Camila Cabello is ripping off. Yes. Um, A totally insane song. Keeps me on my toes the whole time. When the final little twist happens and you get Playboy Cardi rapping over like an extra layer of synth and and 808, like his deep voice flow. It's just this, the video, just a total pastiche of all my favorite things. Playboy Cardi's still at the gas station. Yeah. He's just been living at the gas yeah, station. Yeah, seriously. Do you think it's the same gas station or do you I think want he's just traveling from history gas- of Camila Cabello and the team that made this video waiting for Playboy Cardi yeah. to come to out of the freezer <laughs> at the gas station? Like, how long did they have to post up and wait for him to show up to actually shoot this video? Okay, so the, the key credits, and I had to pull it up. Yeah. Like, I also like this song. I don't know if I love it, but I like it a lot. I love it. I love it. Yes, I love it. I love it. Um, I do like it a lot. Um, The real stars here, uh, directed by Nicolas Mendez or Nicolas Mendez, produced by Canada. Yep. I don't know who those people are. Shout out to Canada. Um, You did it. They did it. Um, And and 
Obviously, the recurring punchline about Camila Cabello is, is she lacks a foundational style. She's for, forever. <laughs> you can say that again. <laughs> yes. Um, she is forever uh, reinventing. Uh, you know, even uh, our good friend BB Rexa and Rita Ora have more form styles right, than they found Camille Cabello. Something. Yes, they found then, a home. <laughs> yes, than Camille Cabello. Um, I would say 99 times out of 100, you would hear. Uh, a quote unquote pop star, to me, debatable whether Camille Cabello is like a genuine A list pop star. But you hear a pop star trying something on like this on as a style, and 99 times out of 100, you'd be like, damn, that feels wrong. Why does it feel so right on this record? The reason it feels so right is that it, there is no actual raw material yep. to play with. Yep. It's all outer shell, it's all costume, it's all performance. Um, why is there a random Gucci Mane interpolation in the middle of the song? I have no idea. It doesn't this fit. Is, it doesn't fit at all. <laughs> but like, okay, so the director, A+. plus. The video producer, A+. plus. The song producer, A+. plus. The song writer, A+. plus. The <laughs> A&R executive, A++++. Plus, plus, plus. Everyone involved in this song, A+. plus. Camille Kamehameha? A B, it doesn't B matter. minus, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Genuinely doesn't matter. This is a bizarre it's artifact. Bonkers. It's really strange. Performed mess that results in actual mess, which to me is like what pop music should be. Can I just, okay, I'm gonna do part of the video. <laughs> <laughs> Can you shoots, do the response? Yeah, she shoots up, up the bed. Yeah. <laughs> like, like what, what in, what in tarnation is going on here? It's trying so hard that it's actually avant-garde. I actually agree with that, um, including Playboy Card. You saw her talking about how, like, she just like DM'd him, and then he wrote back CC. Yeah. Um, do you think they still talk? <laughs> I hope so. Um, get look, getting Playboy Cardi to show up anywhere—that's like that's the Herculean task of any. Anybody, you know, ask Aiden Ross. <laughs> getting, yes. getting Playboy Cardi to show up for anything or anywhere uh, is a real challenge. Um, the fact that this song exists, the, video. the fact the video exists, uh, everybody did an amazing job here. I do not know if Camille Cabello can do this five times no, no, or no. 10 times. No, no, no. Uh, but this particular thing, it's so weird. It reminds me a little bit of the. Um, Six four five they are FKA Twig song totally yeah it's so strange and it's such an unlikely intersection although I feel like in that song those are two artists completely aware yeah. of how weird the thing that they're doing is and leaning the f in sure and really finding that common thread in a musical sense I'm genuinely not sure either of these people knew what this thing was going to turn out to be when it when they sat down or stood up to do it. The last thing I will say. Sorry, I have so many thoughts I know, on this. We, should have done we the whole genuinely episode. could have done the whole episode on this. Uh, the last thing I'll say, last time Camila Cabello had a big single. When she did Havana with Young Thug. With Thug, yep. Yeah. That was like the rebirth of Young Thug. That made him a whole new mainstream figure. A plausible pop rap collaborator. We've been hinting, we've been talking about the breadcrumbs of Playboy Cardi sort of coming for the mainstream. This is like... Uh, in addition to the Travis Scott feature, you yes. know, like this is this is the song he has on streaming services, even though he's been putting this. out a lot of music. Yeah, like this is a big look. Let's just play it. You want to take us down a notch? I'm too worked up. Yeah. Um, yeah, my song is very different. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but from another viral star. <laughs> right. Okay. Another viral star. Good transition. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, first of all, my question at the end of this long episode, why is my guy Oliver Anthony music, why was he not on Cowboy Carter? It's I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like, this... Talk about a way to really like plant a flag, tell an interesting story, 
uh, bridge, outsider, insider, bridge divides in America, which uh, both Beyonce and Oliver Anthony, in their own ways, are curious about doing, and the redemptive power of music to do that. I'm just saying, someone. Why are we? Have, why do we have to think of all the good ideas? Is really what I'm saying. Uh, over the weekend on Easter, Oliver Anthony slash Oliver Anthony Music uh, put out "Hymnal of a Troubled Man's Mind." This is a album produced also with old instruments. I mean, c- come on. Anyway, it's going to be on the deluxe. <laughs> Deluxe of Hymnal or Deluxe of Cowboy Carter? He's going to be on the Cowboy Carter Deluxe. Um, so most of these songs, so this is, a, this is his debut album. Most of these songs are re-recorded slash quasi-polished versions of the songs that he's been putting out on YouTube and other streaming services. Uh, Dave Cobb produced this album. But I guess to Dave Cobb's credit... The, uh, a lot of these Cobb productions in the last few years have felt kind of like studiously homogenized, like kind of like um, pumped up roots music. This doesn't feel like that. This let really Oliver Anthony Cook. Yeah, it just has a lot of space. You know, they recorded it in like an old church or whatever with like good acoustics. I mostly prefer the original versions because the original versions of these songs are literally just Oliver Anthony and a guitar sitting in a field somewhere screaming his head off into a microphone. Very affecting. So I kind of, most of this album, as much as I like these songs, I don't need these versions. Like I have the versions that predate them. Those to me remain the canonical versions. There's one new song at the end of this album. It's called Mama's Been Hurtin'. It does the thing that a lot of the great Oliver Anthony songs do, which is um, express skepticism about the American experiment, although maybe not the type of skepticism about the American experiment that most of the music that we like and most of the musicians that we like tend to express, but uh, a sort of parallel skepticism. Um, The way that he sings it, it's probably among the the, uh, most unhinged singing on the record, and I think for him and his voice, that's the best version of Oliver Anthony singing. Um, it's good storytelling. It's measured in terms of pacing, but in terms of emotion, it's really like it's off the charts. Um, I don't really know what's going to happen for Oliver Anthony. On I don't know if he's going to make a much more quote unquote polished record. I have no idea if he's going to be more of a voice of the people person who just does big tours. He's in the middle of a big tour right now, uh, playing for thousands of people in a bunch of likely and also unlikely places. So there's still some motion there. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like six months or 12 months from now. To me, this entire album feels like potentially the capstone on the original version of, of what he brought. And then maybe the next phase, he'll have an era. Maybe he'll have an era, but, uh, Mario is coming. (laughs) Uh, mama's been hurting is maybe the capstone on this, 1.0 1.0 version of Oliver Anthony music. Uh, Beyonce, take a listen, I guess. Never there's been hard times. It's always made hard folks. Who could get it to the other side and not let it be all she wrote? I'd love to live to be an old man, but God, you can take me a young. Mama's been hurting daddy lessons. Like, I, mm. someone mashed those up for us. <laughs> or not. <laughs> so much like the Oliver Anthony album, Jesus was risen on Sunday. Okay. But it strong, took us, strong pivot. But it took us a minute. <laughs> <It's> a, <yeah. laughs> wild, wild pivot. Wild it pivot. took us a minute to get to <laughs> the our, our Easter candy of choice. Yeah. Um, the snack of the week this week. Uh, not bought on has discount. It, has it passed its expiration date? Uh, you think it expired right on, on Easter? Easter? Yeah, I don't know. These are the Dr. Pepper flavored peeps. Okay, can I be really candid? Because this has come up for me in some conversations that I've had over the years. These peeps? Peeps, <laughs> just peeps in general. Oh, yeah, you a peeps guy? No. Right. Almost, I don't think it's I... It's not a good snack. I don't think I ever even tried peeps until... Five to ten years ago. I, yeah. I, I was unaware of their existence. <laughs> Your first peep was ten years ago. Yeah, I think so. Um, the, I, I don't get it. I don't get it either, don't but get you it. love Dr. Pepper. Love Dr. Pepper. All right. Uh, so you're going to tell us if this is also, true. Also, 
you you like cherry Dr Pepper? I don't really drink soda, but like you've tried, you never tried it. I don't think I've ever had cherry Dr Pepper. Cherry Dr Pepper, like it is, it is, it is optimal chemical taste soda. Like you absolutely taste the. You chemical. like chemicals? I got a snack <laughs> for you. You. <laughs> you definitely taste the chemical, but it tastes great. Anyway, sorry. Go All ahead. Right. Here we go. They're still good. Not expired. They're gonna last till next Easter. Let's try these. You've tried them before or no? No. Okay. <laughs> You've tried other flavored peeps? Uh, peeps to me are just... They're they're just like, there's no flavor. Yeah, there's only there's, one flavor. There's no flavor. It, the flavor is the texture. Yeah, we're yeah, going to yeah. find out. Yeah. You get a whole tray to yourself. <laughs> um, this really does make me think of industrial chicken practices. I don't like it. This is, reminds you of eating KFC. <laughs> yeah, this is not good. Oh, they're a funny color. They're Dr. Pepper-ish color. But, like, it's not encouraging that it's still just straight white on the inside. So the coating is Dr. Pepper? Yeah, and the rest is marshmallow. Smells like Dr. Pepper. Mm -hmm. Mm. (laughs) Um, So bubbly. It almost tastes carbonated. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. Um, it's better than a regular peep. Yeah, uh, regular peeps are, are not good. My main takeaway from this is if you are able to create essentially sprinkled on Dr. Pepper, I would like to have that in like a spice pot, like what you would get like garlic powder in uh-huh. or onion powder. Can I just get this sprinkled on Dr. Pepper in a bottle like that to add it to like Ice cream or something. Yeah, is that the first thing you would put it on? Like vanilla ice cream? Yeah, I think so. Okay. These are good. <laughs> You're a shicko. <laughs> um, this is low-key. Not bad. Yeah. Um, Way better than I thought. My expectations were low. I see why they did this. I don't know why, really, but whoever figured it out and was like, no, no, I swear, it's going to work, was not wrong. <laughs> it's a six. I was going to say six and a half. Oh, so you but but you like it though? You sure it's not? Yeah, but for I you? thought it was gonna be like in the ones. Yeah, it's a peep is a peep maxes out <laughs> at six and a half. Can someone literally just send me a bottle or a sachet of the sprinkled on dehydrated cri- Dr. crystalline Pepper crystalline Dr. Yeah. Pepper? Yeah, that I'd be curious to have. Yeah. Um, if if you're the food scientist or whatever the company that makes Dr. Pepper is. Tastes like Dr. Pepper. It absolutely tastes like Dr. Pepper. Ah, the texture. I just, I hate the texture. I mean, artificial marshmallow, like, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a tough sell. Um, I hate the texture, but I will say, like, recently, um, I was probably off of TikTok. I saw someone, some doctor be like, some do- doctor, doctor. <laughs> Um, say that if you have a really bad cough, which, you know, if you have COVID or yet any other bronchial thing, uh, that the gelatin in marshmallow, if you chew it, can coat your throat and make it a little less. <laughs> we, can't ver- we can't verify this. I mean, I tried. I do want to say I tried it. Not bad. Try honey. <laughs> it's made by God's creatures. <laughs> um, that is our show. <laughs> Every podcast ever is at nytimes.com slash podcast. Uh, podcast Deluxe. Lil John interview, girl in red interview, us talking about meta discourse, all of that in these chairs, youtube.com slash podcast, like, and subscribe. Email us for the upcoming mailbag episode. That's podcast at nytimes.com and subscribe to podcast anywhere you get your audio or audio visual content. That is Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and beyond. Uh, our senior producer is Sawyer Roque. Our editor is Jamie Heffitz. Special thanks to Leslie Davis, Pat Gunther, Nell Galogli, Neil Lossom, Karen Gans, Pedro Rosado. We'll be back next week.